you're worshiping God now through the proclamation of his word. And if you have a Bible or someone near you has one you can look on with, let's all get our eyes on Romans chapter 8, which is the verse-by-verse study that we're in now called The Power to Change. And I've had the unfortunate responsibility of communicating to you that uh, Christians are not changing. They're really not. Every survey that's taken indicates that the behavior of Christians is really just not that much different than the behavior of those who do not profess faith in Christ. Fact is, Christians cheat on tests, Christians cheat on spouses, Christians cheat on taxes at the same rates that non-believers do. Christians get angry, Christians get divorced, Christians get consumed with getting stuff. We worship more, but we don't love others more. In fact, we might love others less than those who don't name the name of Christ. This is a serious, serious problem especially when you consider that the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification is the thing that follows salvation. Uh, It's the process by which God takes a converted sinner and makes them holy. Many who profess faith in Christ are not in any demonstrable measure more holy than they were before they had that born-again experience. And Jesus said in his, uh, what's known as the high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So that's what we're actually uh, going for today. We're going to use the word of God and pray that by the spirit of God, it would have an impact upon the people of God. Never, never has the word of God been so readily available, yet made such a little difference in the way that people live. Just read that yourself and think about it for a moment. I mean, the Word of God's everywhere, right? It's on radio, it's on television, it's on podcasts, it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram. It's If you want it there, it's in your face every moment of every day, but it doesn't seem to be having the transformational impact that it's supposed to have. And I want to try to explain why that is because I think that like a lot of surveys, the statistics are a little bit, um, you know, distorted. Let me try to use an illustration. Supposing that we wanted to conduct a survey about um, how many real Americans there are. And suppose that we decided we were going to conduct our survey about real Americans along these three emphases. A real American supports U.S. policy abroad, and if there's a war, if there's a struggle, if there's a sanction, I'm a real American, I'm supporting that. And real Americans pay taxes to the U.S. government, and real Americans live somewhere in the United States or one of its territories, if that was the three conditions. But wait, But what if the data was collected from people in South Africa and Norway and Brazil? You say, of course, they're not scoring very high on the real American test. They don't even live here. Of course, they don't pay taxes. They don't live in a, in a, they don't support U.S. policy. They don't live in a U.S. state or territory. See, that's the point, isn't it? The biggest problem with the Christian surveys is the definition of Christian. So let me ask you this. Are those attending mainline Protestant churches that, deny the deity of Christ, deny the necessity of the new birth, uh, deny the reality of an eternal heaven and hell, um, deny that the Bible is the authoritative, infallible word of God. Are those people Christians? They might be Christian in some broad sense of the descriptive term. They're certainly not Buddhist, but we shouldn't expect any redeemed behavior from those who reject the redeeming gospel. Let me ask you this, are, are Roman Catholics saved? Those who confess their sins to a priest and call him father? When Jesus said, call no man on earth father, but only your father who is in heaven. And of course, the New Testament teaches there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So I'm not saying that mainline people can't be saved or the Catholics can't be saved. I'm just saying they can't be saved by believing what they profess in those. But it's not just them. Let me ask you, are habitually bigoted Baptists saved? Are porn-watching Presbyterians saved? Are alcoholic Anglicans saved? 
I think you get my point, our, <laughs> lest we leave ourselves excluded, our non-denominationalists non who are non-submissive to God's word saved. Do you get my point? If you're looking to identify the impact of the gospel, you should only be taking your survey among the truly redeemed, but we don't even know who's truly saved. Some may be saved in all of these pockets, but certainly not all of them are, not if they profess what their faith groups profess. Um, I guess I want you to have a greater confidence in the transforming power of the gospel. I know my life has been changed by Jesus Christ, and I think Many of you would want to stand up and say, I saw addictions broken, I saw my marriage healed, I saw an empty, uh, aimless life set on a path of purpose. I used to be bitter and hateful, and now I'm more loving and forgiving. Amen, amen, amen. So I preach that Christians aren't really changing because statistics say so, but I wouldn't want that to weigh on you so heavily that you don't think that the gospel is having a powerful impact because where people truly are born again, it truly is. Make a note of this. The root problem in surveys of Christian behavior is not the absence of change in the true Christ followers, but the absence of true Christ conversion in every corner of the Christian church. With that as a Backdrop, let me just say that this is not a new problem. This is not a new problem. People professing faith in Christ but not really knowing him. In, John 18, in Matthew 18, uh, 15, Jesus said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And we read that so fast, but it's more like, Lord, 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 do this for me. Lord, do this for me. Bumper sticker wall poster, you know, clever soundbite Christianity. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things that I say? In fact, that phrase is repeated in Matthew 7 where Jesus say, many people will say to me on that day, and he's talking on the final day, the day when no one has any more days, the last day, the final day, the great day. In fact, the Bible calls it the great and terrible day of the Lord. And Jesus says, on that day, many will say to me, um, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. I did many wonderful works in your name, Jesus says, and then I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. So if we're going to do a survey on the impact of the gospel, we would want that survey to be done only amongst those who are redeemed. But the Bible says the Lord knows those that are his, None of us could even confidently predict who should be questioned. I think the real question is not, are they all changing? Is their profession all true? The only person you need to be concerned about is square in the mirror when you're brushing your teeth. That one. And note this. The power to change is the Holy Spirit. Let me just read it. The power to change is the Holy Spirit changing how I think as a Christian. But first and foremost, I must actually be one. The New Testament says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. It says, in fact, Paul says, amazingly, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Make sure your life is indicative of one who has been truly born again. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he'd rank pretty high on any survey of Christ's transformation. Paul said, I fear that having preached to others, I myself would be a docimos, rejected, Everyone should have the sense that if my life doesn't continue to match my profession, I may never have truly found the one whom to know is life eternal. You say, well, then can I really know? I mean, how can I know? How can I, how can I know for sure? You can, and in uh, the weeks to come, between now and Easter, I'm going to preach on the five evidences of life in the Spirit. So we're gonna, it's coming right here at Romans 8. You can read ahead. I hope you do every day. And I'm going to speak another message on the five experiences of life in the Spirit. You're not going to be doubting. You're not going to be wondering. You'll know. It'll be clear. The Word of God makes it clear. But first, we have to finish uh, what we started, which this is part two. Part two, long intro, sorry. Um, I'm ready to get into Romans 8 now. How to think like a Christian. Before I read the passage, let's just uh, pray together. Father, as this Word goes out, I pray for every hungry heart 
that will hear it. Close to home here in the greater Chicagoland area and in the Midwest and throughout these United States and North America and now wonderfully uh, blessed to hear in various places around the world in different time zones, in different cultures, in different places, but where the word of God abides forever. And we pray that this life-changing, eternal message given to us by your grace and through your Holy Spirit would find uh, rich soil in our hearts. As the seed is implanted, protect us that the enemy might not snatch it away and cause us to examine it. We long to be transformed by the gospel. And so we pray for the Holy Spirit to do that work in us afresh and deeper and more truly than ever. Help us first to understand it and then to obey it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last time uh, we learned uh, life in the flesh is desire fulfillment thinking. And life in the spirit is delayed gratification thinking. The problem is, is that the life in the flesh thinking is fun thinking. It's right now what I want, what feels good to me thinking. And life in the spirit is hang on, stay strong, someday you'll see it more than ever kind of thinking. And so thankfully the text turns toward motivation. If I could retitle this message, I wouldn't make it a part two of how to think. I would make it this motivations to life in the spirit. So if you've been kind of feeling like, gosh, I'm sure that life in the spirit is the better way to go, but I, I like a lot of things about life in the flesh. Okay. So here they come. Um, motivations to life in the spirit. Um, first, the negative, first, the negative. And before I even give you the first one, let me just read the passage. Some of its review, Romans eight, one through eight. You with me? Look at God's word. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. It's all right there. Start with this. Motivations to life in the Spirit begin with consequences of life in the flesh, Here they are, three flesh consequences. Can you see them in the text? You know, like, I like living in the flesh. I I love setting my mind on the things of the flesh. Man, I never have a better evening than when I can put my feet on an easy chair and, and set my mind on the things of the flesh. Okay, okay. But think about where that road is taking you. The first word is not awesome. Notice. In verse 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is, say it. Now, if you're looking at the Bible, you can fill in the blank, can't you? I'll give you another chance. Romans 8, 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is, say it, death. It's death. And so that raises this question, what death is being talked about? Let me eliminate some for sure nots. Ready? Ready? Well, first of all, is it talking about for to set the mind on the flesh is metaphoric death? You know, like, I couldn't believe he called me up front. Man, I I, I couldn't believe he asked me to talk in front of everyone without even telling me. I I could have just died. I can't believe she put that picture of us on Facebook. She didn't even ask me. I could have just died when I saw it up there. Is that what it's talking about, metaphoric death? I turn to somebody and say, no, it's not, it's not talking about, it's not talking about metaphoric death. Okay, well, um, what about uh, physical death? If you set your mind on the things of the flesh, you're going to die, bro. You're going to die. You're going to end up in a box. Is that what it's talking about? 
Um, <laughs> no, it's for sure not talking about that. If it was metaphoric death, that would be kind of a silly point to make. I could have just died. If he's talking about physical death, that's a kind of a nonsensical point because we're all going to die. Every single person here in this recording session is going to die, true or false. Every single person who listens to this in every place it's going to go and every person who never hears of us or our ministry, all of us, coast to coast, worldwide, north and south of the equator, all human beings will die. It says in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die. That was settled when you were born. Life is a temporary, not a permanent, and you only get one time around. All right? So why would it make the point that if you're in the flesh, you're going to die, but if you're in the spirit, you're going to die too? That's not a point. So that's not what it's talking about. Some people say it's, it's talking about premature death. If you live your life in the flesh, can you, <laughs> can you picture that tomato-faced preacher? I heard some of these growing up, you know? If you keep on with those whining women, you're going to die early. You're going to die early if you keep on with those whining women. Well, that might actually be true, but that's not really the point that the text is making here, that for those who live in the flesh, life might be shorter. I have to say, some people die uh, prematurely who are very, very godly people. And some people live like the devil and seem to live a hundred years so there's no automatic connection there but the text is making an automatic connection it's saying that in some way let me read it to you again for to set the mind on the flesh is death in some real way flesh thinking creates death in you and me so if it isn't metaphoric death and it isn't physical death and it isn't really premature death, you say, what about consequential death? I was in the flesh so long that, man, if I could just raise my kids again. I was in the flesh so much as a parent. It just, it just killed my family. I was in the flesh so much that it killed my marriage. I was in the flesh so much that it murdered my reputation. I, there may be an element of that. And as the text goes on in verse 10, um, I'll just show you. But if Christ is in you, through the, uh, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life. So the body is dead because of sin. I'm just going to say we might... It's not metaphoric, it's not physical, it's not premature. It might have a circumstantial element. Verse 13 says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That seems to be getting into our here and now life. But can I just set that aside for another week? For right now, for here in verse 6, it's for sure talking about spiritual death. Okay? If you live according to the flesh, you will die spiritually. Some other verses that speak about this, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. That's obviously talking about eternal death because the next part of the verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life. It doesn't use the word eternal twice, but it means that. The wages of sin is eternal death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I could, you know, adapt that verse very accurately and biblically to say the wages of flesh is eternal death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. How could that possibly be talking about physical dying? If you go the right way or the wrong way, in life, you all die. You all end up in a box. James chapter 1, verse 15 says that desire gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death. So there is a way in which life in the flesh leads to not the first death, but actually the death that's talked about, can I just turn with me if you want to, or at least keep your finger in Romans 8, I'll go right back there. But listen to this from Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. 
and the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were... Notice that in eternity, the unsaved, the lifetime of flesh that led to death, they're just called the dead. Nowhere are Christ followers called the dead in eternity. They're called the living. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the second death, the lake of fire. So how do we interpret Scripture? We interpret it in the passage. We interpret it in the totality of God's Word. When it says here, Romans 6, to set the mind on the flesh is death, it's talking about second death, eternal death, hell itself. That if I set my mind on the things of the flesh continually, habitually, increasingly, then that indicates the life of a person who's never been truly born again. And where are they going to end up? In hell. No joy in saying that, but I hope you know that I don't sit in my office preparing, thinking a lot of times about whether you like it. I hope that you've gathered here because you want to hear it, whatever the Word of God says. And what the Word of God says is it's motivating us to life in the Spirit. And the first consequence of life in the flesh is death. Note this, a habitual life of me first, flesh now, feelings are foremost, is a life where no saving, I gotta, I gotta go over that again, slowly for you and for me. Deal with it. A habitual that means by habit, by repetition, by no apparent change ever. A habitual life of me first, flesh now, feelings are foremost, is a flesh life where no saving faith resides. We all hear the voice of sin. We all hear the knock, knock, knock of temptation. When was the last time you said no? No. No in the power of the Spirit. No for the glory of God. No for the life that's promised to me now and through eternity. If you don't have a lot of examples of no to my flesh and less to my, yet no to my flesh and yes to my spirit, then the right question is on the table. Have you ever truly been born again? Flesh consequences, death. And then let's get our next one from the text, right? Because I don't sit and make these lists up, right? So look for the next one in the text, reading from verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. We'll come back to that. For the mind that is set on the flesh is, there's the second characteristic, consequence, motivation to life in the spirit. Because the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God. It's hostile toward God. I think we often lose sight of this, that my disobedience, my lawlessness, my rebellion is hostility toward God. That, that hurts our hearts. I, don't, I, don't, I love God. I love God. I go to church every I love God. I love His Word. And I could sing of His love. I could sing of His love forever. I could sing of His. But isn't it truth that a lot of people should be singing, I could sing of His love on Sunday, but I'll be in the flesh again on Monday. That's not the life of a Christian. And we all fall in many ways, the scripture said. And I'm not trying to hold up some standard of perfection that is unachievable for us. But look in your heart. Do you see this reality that a life characterized by, the word here, hostility, um, ekthros in the original is used 32 times in the New Testament. It means enmity or hatred. A settled disposition of rebellion. A steadfast refusal of God's authority. Rebellion against rightful rulership. That's what it is. Let's look at that again in the text, verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh, we're being motivated away from that, because the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God. It is hostility, and it is, notice this thirdly, or even before I go to it, let me ask you, do you have a life of 
hostility toward God? Look over the last few years. Now, if you're young, if you're new to life in Christ, then you probably, huh, you probably don't maybe have enough chapters in your book yet to be able to analyze this, but did you ever wonder why old people are so like crotchety? They're upset. I don't like that. I don't like this. I don't appreciate. I don't know why people, the whole world's going to hell in a... Why are they like that? It's because a lifetime of life in the flesh is, is hostility. I'm kicking. What did, you, what, did, what did Jesus say to Paul when he, when he met him on the road as Saul? And he, was, he said, why are you kicking against the goads, those pricks that would be placed around the front of a plowing animal to keep it from turning to the left or the right? And to go against God is to inflict pain upon myself. But I want what I want. And so I keep bringing the pain upon myself. And because it's a life of suffering, a life of flesh, you know, the pleasures of sin are for a season. And in time, we begin to see that we are causing injury to our souls. And so we say, I must turn in a better direction. And if you don't relent, if you continue in your rebellion, which is hostility, you're going to become this person because you're going to realize the time to change is gone. And you picked your course and, and you followed it and... I'm not saying that people can't repent in their 70s. A thief on a cross was converted, you know, 10 seconds before he went into eternity. I just think the further you go into flesh and hostility, the less likely it is that you'll ever repent. And we don't, I don't, if there's one thing I want more than anything with all the things that we've been through, I just don't want to be an angry old man. I just don't want to be a bitter person. We should be getting sweeter as the years go by, sweeter as the years go by. And if we're not more loving and more joyful and more confident in our God and more excited for eternity, if we're gripping this life more tightly by the year, something's really wrong with that. That's life in the flesh. That is for sure not a life in the spirit. So, um, here's the third consequence. Hopefully this is, is am I motivating you? Am I motivating you? These are motivations to put life in the flesh aside. It's death. It's not going anywhere good. It leads to the lake of fire. That should have been enough. Let's pray. But we get more from the text, so we'll take more. Um, it's death. It's hostility. And then this. I said it already. It's lawlessness. Look at that also in verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. God's law says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Have one day a week that's different. It doesn't have to be legalistic. It just has to be restful. It just has to be refreshing. But my kids have games. And I've got a paper due. And I've got to have that presentation ready for work. And I'm not taking a day to rest. Not this week. It's not convenient for me. That's not the life of a person in submission to God's law. And God's laws are for our good. God's laws are life. God's law says, don't covet what your neighbor has. I, I should have a car like that. I should have a house like that. I should have vacations like that. I deserve those things. I want them. The Bible says, don't do that. Don't. If you catch yourself coveting what your neighbor has, you're supposed to put that down in the spirit and submit to God's law and say, I, it's only a trick. It's just an illusion. I won't be happier having, the Bible says, don't steal. That's one of God's laws. In the top 10 we're on here, Exodus 20. It says don't steal, but I have to have it. I want it. I'm going to take it. And a Christ follower believes increasingly that that's a life of misery. And so in the spirit, and we're going to get to that very, very extensively. In the spirit, I put down 
what's in the flesh. I don't have the strength to do it myself. I'm still a fallen human being. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, I put down the flesh. Flesh consequences death, hostility, lawlessness. Lawlessness is not struggle, by the way. If I can make just a point of that. Lawlessness is not struggle. Um, lawlessness, do we have that quote? I think I just gave it to you as I came in. Lawlessness is seen not in the periodic struggle, but in the habitual failure. So I want to just be super clear about this. Paul says in Romans 7, wretched man that I am. He was having a real struggle with sin. And lawlessness is not the mother in tears in a puddle after another temper with her children that she promised herself would never happen again, but it did. I'm not talking about that. It, it's, it's not, lawlessness not, is not in lust, failure, confessed and forsaken sooner and with a longer period of victory. That's not what I'm talking about. Lawlessness is not the battle with covetousness or the grief over my earthbound struggles. That's not lawlessness. Lawlessness is the belief that I'm okay the way I am. Lawlessness is determined hard-heartedness about my own sin struggles and my frequent flesh failure with no transformation trajectory. That's lawlessness. That's life in the flesh. That's an unconverted person. And I pray it isn't you, but I'd rather have you awake to that reality today than live, on it, live in it any longer. And I want to be, God help me to be a place that you can turn to hear what's actually true according to God's word. Lawlessness is cluelessness to my hard-heartedness about my own sin struggles and frequent flesh failures. I'm clueless about them. I'm hard-hearted about them. And I have no transformation trajectory. You say, James, what do you mean by that? I'd like to answer that question. I mean this. If this is uh, time, and this is allow a short form here. This is Christ-likeness, okay? Like Jesus. And we're going to plot your over time. So if this is like, wow, and this is life, a long time, many years, what does your trajectory look like? Because if your trajectory looks like this, That's, that's not the life of a Christian. There's a lot of people hanging around the church that aren't converted. They're just not. They got a quick offer. They got a sign here and you go to heaven. But they've never really repented of their sins and believed upon Christ for their forgiveness and yielded their life entirely to a new master. The life of a Christian, it might have some of this. It might even have some of this where I go below my previous, but in the end, if I could plot it out, the just look at the stock market, right? If you look at the last two weeks in the stock market, you know, it's like this. But if you look at it over the course of the last hundred years, you can barely see the changes that, that, that from glory to glory, that we all are being changed into that image. And I'm not asking you to focus on your bad year or your bad quarter. I'm asking you to focus on the trajectory of your life. If there's not increasing love and likeness of Jesus, that's lawlessness, y'all. And uh, if you're looking to the mystery, for, to the, if you're looking for the answer to the question of why some Christians don't change, Maybe they're not Christians. Maybe they're not Christians yet. Flesh consequences, death, hostility, lawlessness. And then in summary form, verse 8, Romans 8, 8. has a ring to it, doesn't it? Romans 8, 8, here it is. Those who are in the flesh 
that means habitually, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They just can't please Him. Life in the flesh is a life of pleasing self. Somebody's pleased. Every decision pleases somebody. Neither pleases my flesh or by the Spirit it pleases God. And that, that includes, by the way, church in the flesh. If you're like, oh, I, got, I made it this week, I got here, I got here. Yeah, but if you're at church in the flesh and you're still lawless, we, we don't need to get our dead carcasses into a church. We need to get our lives in submission to the Holy Spirit. So victory pleases God. Struggle where God wins in the end pleases God. But loud on Sundays and languishing all week does not please God, and it isn't safe. That is life in the flesh. So for every person listening now, increasing flesh or increasing spirit, you're one of those two. Increasing flesh or increasing spirit, which is it? One is the true life in Christ. The other one is the religionist or the pagan, which is worse, by the way, the religionist or the pagan. For sure, the religionist, the pagan, isn't this? He doesn't profess anything. He's he's still got a good shot. He's just he's just got to crash what he's doing, and he's ready to be forgiven and saved. And but the religionist has to reject all the false stuff encrusted around their heart, all that religion that makes them think they're fine. So. Let's review. Flesh consequences, death, hostility, lawlessness, cannot please God. Ready for some good news? I always feel the same way. I've been preaching for so long. I'm still doing this. Oh, my gosh. And I always feel the same way. And the text always does the same thing. It gives you all this bad news. And then I I would always say, all in favor of the good news? Here it comes. Not just negative motivations, although I, I will say this before I get into the positives. So often it seems that the warning portion is more than the reward portion. Have you ever noticed that in Scripture? Why, why do you think that is? Isn't it true, though, that the warning, the fear of what might happen if I don't, is often a greater motivator than the rewards that I will get someday? I was thinking about this, and I remembered a time. Can you picture a kind of a late 1950s automobile? with a steering wheel that, um, yeah, I mean, that is it. I have that picture so deeply ingrained in my mind, I can barely (laughs) describe it. I think this is my earliest memory. I was born in 1960, and I couldn't have been more than three or four. My two brothers who were uh, born at the time, my older brother, my just younger brother, our parents went to a furniture store. It was, I remember it was called Patton's, and it was on Warncliffe Road in London, Ontario, where I grew up. They pulled up right in front of the store. I guess they needed some furniture. I don't have the details. I was younger then, three, four. They weren't even hardly sharing their thoughts with me. But they parked in front of the store, and all I remember is my older brother. I hope he sees this. I pray to God he sees this, but I do forgive him. He began to egg me on. You should pull that le- le- lever. You should pull that. You should pull that. You should pull that. You should, like from the lake of fire itself, you should pull that. You should pull that. All I remember is, is the more he said it, the more I wanted, can you guess? The more I wanted to pull it. I didn't have any idea what it was or what would happen. I just knew that he felt it needed to move. So I, I don't know, did my dad leave the car running? Can you pull a car into... Like, can you change the gear when it's not even running? I don't know. I'm not a mechanic guy. All I know is I could pull it, and I got up and just yanked on that thing. Well, the next thing that was happening was the car was rolling back out onto the busy four-lane road in rush hour traffic. The next thing that happened was the man. You know, when you're a little kid, you don't even see the whole person. I, I remember seeing his big back. And I was kind of like, here, I don't, I don't know. He, some guy ripped open the door, jumped in the car, slammed it into park. Now, I don't remember, this is my earliest memory, I don't remember if he shook me or just spoke to me. 
but like a person reacting in terror themselves. He got the message across to me that I've never forgotten. I, you can't find cars like this anymore, but the, on occasion when I've been in a car like this, I get a little nervous. I, I, I should pull that. No, I don't think that. But I mean, that made such a mark on me, the warning. And then I do believe my father followed up with appropriate consequences as well. Um, I wish I could remember whether my brother got it too. All I know is that's a big picture for me of the power of warning. So I'm going to go into the rewards now, but I'm not diminishing in any sense that frequently in Scripture the greater emphasis is on the warning of you're going to get this if you get it wrong. Death and hostility and lawlessness and cannot please God, but spirit rewards. These are so briefly stated, but they will be expanded on through the rest of Romans 8. Let's check them out here at the end of verse 6. I skipped over it when I read it first and said we would come back, and now we are. For to set the mind, verse 6, Romans 8, 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So spirit rewards, number one, life. Yes, eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But also, more than that, John 10, 10. Would you you write the reference down? Jot it down, John 10, 10. Do you know what John 10, 10 is? Do you know? Do you know John 3, 16? Do you know John 10, 10? It's pretty memorable. Every preacher knows John 10, 10. We quote it frequently. John 10, 10. Do you know what's there? Here it is. Jesus, I have come that they might have, you know, life, life. They're all going to the lake of fire, the second death, but I have come that some might have life. And here's the remarkable part, and have it more abundantly. Without a detailed exegesis, I can just tell you that the tenses in the passage are clearly indicating that eternal life begins at the point of conversion to Christ, that we already are having that abundant, overflowing quality of life. Life in the Spirit is abundant life, abundant life, new life. We used to sing a chorus as a child, I remember so clearly, new life in Christ, abundant and free. What glory shines, what joys are mine, what wondrous blessings I see. My past with its sin, the searching, the strife, forever gone. There's a bright new dawn, for in Christ I have found new life. That is the life of the Christ follower. And it is so glorious compared to the filth of the flesh life that never fulfills. Remember John 10.10. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that your best, happiest, most fulfilling life is a life in Christ? Do you believe that? It's a simple question. Let me ask you again. Do you believe that? Do you believe that your best, happiest, and most fulfilling life here on terra firma is life in Christ? It's so important that you do. No guilt, no shame, no fear of dying. In fact, I hardly ever show a movie clip. Almost never. If you've been listening to me preach for 20 years, you might have seen me do it one time. But I just love that uh, now older movie, um, Shawshank Redemption. And uh, here's a little clip from it that hints at this matter of life. It's down there and I'm in here. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. Get busy living. Get busy dying. Get busy living or get busy dying. 
it's such an awesome scene, these two people who are uh, in prison for the best years of their lives for crimes they apparently committed. And he so, Tim Robbins, that character, so longed for a life that he had dreamed in Mexico, but he had to accept that's not the life that I get. I get this life right here. And he had to come to the conclusion, I have to make a choice about my life. I can whine and complain and other words come to mind about my lot in life. But the choice just comes down to this. I got to get busy living where I am or get busy dying. It's so perfect and so on point. Life in the spirit is abundant life. And then finally, thanks for your patient listening. Just give me a couple more minutes for this. Life and peace. Last time, I'll read it. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Now, the Bible talks about three kinds of peace. First of all, it talks about peace with God, that we're all born in a state of hostility toward God. And um, uh, the peace... Uh, with God is what Romans 5.1 talks about. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's conversion, that's salvation. The hostility is gone, the enmity is removed, the barrier between us and God is gone. We can enter into true fellowship with Him through faith in Jesus. The whole New Testament talks about that over and over, peace with God. And then there's a Another little variant, peace from God. Many of Paul's epistles start off with the greeting, peace from God and from our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a, something that we wish for one another. One, a wonderful thing to wish for those you love is to wish for them peace. And uh, the third occurrence is not peace with God or peace from God, but peace of God. This is peace in the life of the Christ follower, the peace of God. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27, he said to his disciples, peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give to you. In other words, the world gives and takes back, but Jesus, I'm giving you this permanently, my peace. Later we come to understand that the peace that he's offering is actually a person. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. So important is this Holy Spirit peace. Life in the Spirit gives it to us that Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. It means literally let it act as the umpire. Every moment we're making decisions, what will I think about? Don't give up your peace so easily. Think about the things that lead to peace. That's such good counsel for me, and I hope it is for you too. Think about the things that lead to peace. Don't give up your peace. What should I think about today? What should I focus on today? Will that lead to peace? You say, well, James, I'm really really struggling with peace. Well, I'm going to pray with you about that right now, but before I do, let me say that we're coming back uh, next time with five assurances of life in the Spirit. You should be ending this message, well, I want to live in the Spirit, and, and, and what do I get when I'm in life in the Spirit, and how do I know when I'm in the Spirit? All that's coming. We're just taking it very slowly because we want a deep, life-changing experience with the powerful message of Romans chapter 8, the power to change. So if you sense that you're lacking this peace of God, the seminal New Testament instruction on this point is Philippians 4, 6, and 7, which says, be anxious for nothing. Don't give up your peace for anything. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. That would be probably for yourself. Supplication is making requests. In everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. Not because he doesn't know already, but he needs to know that you know, that he now knows because you told him in prayer. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, always find the things to be thankful for. You have so many things you can be thankful for, don't you? By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart from all those things that trouble us, from all those things that grieve us, from all those things that vex us. The peace of God is a beautiful, beautiful thing, and it's one of the things that comes from life in the Spirit. I'd like to pray that peace for you and for me and for all of us right now. Come on, let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for your word. I'm so grateful for your word, right? I'm grateful for its clarity. I'm grateful for the force with which the Holy Spirit brings it to bear upon our souls, and we have all felt the singeing effects of the flesh. Not one of us can't relate to those warnings 
but we long for better things and fuller things and greater faith things. And so we ask you, this is our request, we're asking that our anxieties and concerns and fears and flesh moments could become noticeably and markedly less and that you would make us this week until we're together again that you would make us this week increasingly alert and sensitive to those ways that we give up our peace we want life in the spirit we want the peace of the holy spirit and so we ask for it Jesus, you said, whatever you ask in faith, believe that you have received it and it will be done for you. And so by faith now, we receive the life and peace of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us here on our YouTube channel. And I hope you'll check back with us often as we post uh, fresh biblical teaching verse by verse, right from God's Word. Now, I hope you didn't make the mistake that so many Christians make, which is to think about somebody that really needs to hear this message. I hope instead that you have allowed, as I've tried to, allowed the Word of God to penetrate your own heart. A good little uh, check on that is, why don't you leave a comment below? What specifically was the Holy Spirit speaking to you about? What was the Holy Spirit teaching you during this message? What a verse or phrase in scripture stood out to you. Leave the comment below and uh, join those who are moving from being just hearers of the word to actual doers. Thanks for commenting. We'll see you next time.